Hello and welcome to the webinar on integrated club root management in brassica crops on organic farms. This is your host, Alice Formiga of the eOrganic Community of Practice at extension.org. You can find all eOrganic articles, videos, and recorded webinars on our website at extension.org, and you can find it on the eOrganic YouTube channel. So today, I'm very pleased to welcome two colleagues of mine here at Oregon State University, Aaron Heinrichs and Alex Stone. Um, Aaron Heinrich is a faculty research assistant in the Department of Horticulture at Oregon State University, and he has an MS in soils and biogeochemistry from the University of California at Davis. And he works on vegetable crop production issues involving soil pH, nutrient, weed irrigation, and soil-borne disease management. Alex Stone is a vegetable cropping system specialist at the Oregon State University Department of Horticulture, and she formerly worked as an organic vegetable farmer in Massachusetts. So with that brief introduction, I'm going to hand the screen control over to our first presenter, Alex Stone. All right. So I just first wanted to um, point you all to this new extension bulletin on the very topic that we are talking about today. That this publication was led by Aaron Heinrich, but also several other, other people who work in soils and vegetable production here at OSU um, contributed to it. And so a lot of what we're talking about today, you can also find that information in this extension bulletin. So we're going to jump right in by talking about diagnosis, or how do you know that you have club root? And in this picture here, you see very classic above-ground symptoms of club root, which is where you see very healthy plants in part of the field, but then in this sort of irregularly shaped area, you see a lot of stunting and yellowing leaves and um, not very productive growth. Another really characteristic symptom of club root is that the plants will be wilting even though it looks like there's ample soil moisture so that there's no reason for them to be wilting. These above ground symptoms are not sufficient in and of themselves to diagnose club root. You really have to dig up the roots. And when you dig up the roots, you see symptoms like this. These are very severe symptoms of club root. This is Aaron holding up a turnip with very severe clubbing, as you can see. And because turnip is a root crop, you, you dig them up. And so you will very much know when you have club root there. This is clubbing on the roots of broccoli. And since you never dig up the roots of broccoli, you might have club root but not know because you didn't dig up the roots to see. Um, these symptoms are very characteristic of club root, so it's, it's a very easy disease for farmers to diagnose by themselves because no other pathogen or physiological disorder will develop these types of root symptoms. It's important to realize that you won't always see such severe symptoms in the field, and it's useful to be able to diagnose club root when the symptoms are are, are quite mild because that's how you know that you have club root propagules in a field. And so here's a photo of a broccoli plant with some very healthy broccoli roots and then just this very small club on one of the roots and probably that's another club there. So one of the things that's really important is to know what healthy broccoli or other cabbage family crop roots look like and then understand both what severe symptoms look like as well as these more mild symptoms so that you're better able to diagnose this disease in the field. So club root is a very important disease of cabbage family plants all over the world and it can cause much damage and including up to complete crop failure. And so um, Aaron and I started working on club root quite a few years ago because growers in our area here in Western Oregon were saying that they were seemed to be having increasing problems and experiencing more and more economic damage to this, to this pathogen. And so we started looking into it. And so here you have a story from one of a fresh market farmer here in the valley talking about how over about a three-year period 
they felt that they experienced about a 25% loss in their brassica crop yields due to club root, which cost it, was costing them somewhere between sixty dollars and $80,000 a year, which is, of course, a lot of economic damage, and that they said they were running out of club root-free ground on which to rotate brassica crops. So these are fairly common experiences with brassica crop growers who, who rely heavily on that as part of their cropping mix. So when you're trying to manage any disease, it's really important to understand what is causing it, the pathogen, as well as the life history of that pathogen or its disease cycle, as you see here. So the pathogen that causes club root is called Plasmodiophora brassicae. And this is its disease cycle or life cycle. So the, the, the part of the life cycle that we're all most familiar with is this part here where you actually have a crop in the field and it has become infected and you get these disfigured roots here, which are the clubs. These are very pretty clubs. Usually they're not quite this pretty. And so each of those clubs is filled with thousands and thousands and thousands of these resting spores. And, and, and either before harvest or when you incorporate the crop residue after harvest, those clubs disintegrate and they release these resting spores into the soil. And one of the important things to, to understand about club root and this pathogen is that these resting spores, and resting spores for any pathogen are the spores that allow it to survive without a, a host. And one of the things to know about club root is that these resting spores can survive for many years. It's not very well understood exactly how long they survive, and it may in fact vary from location to location and depend on soil management and other environmental conditions on farms. You can read in the literature and in extension bulletins that these spores can live for up to 20 years, but that is very, very rare and possibly a very, very low percentage of the spores. So for the moment, let's just say that they live probably for three to eight or more years in the soil, which is a very long time. And then we'll talk a little bit more about this when we talk about rotation later. So these resting spores are, are sitting in the soil for a long time. The way that they cause a new infection is when a, a, a susceptible host is planted in the field and there's pretty high soil moisture content, the resting spore germinates and creates this swimming spore called a zoospore. And they have these two little um, tails on them and they swim, which requires a fairly high level of soil moisture so that they can swim from the spore over to the root hairs of the susceptible host crop that you just planted. There's then another cycle, but, and at this time they don't actually create the clubs. There's another cycle of these swimming spores at which point these, the zoospores infect the root and not the root hair, and then they create the clubs and then that starts this life cycle again. So two of the important aspects of this is that the resting spores live for a long time and that in order to infect Typically, you need very high events of very high soil moisture. Here in Western Oregon, it's a Mediterranean climate, which means that in the summer, it rarely rains, although sometimes it rains, and it's pretty hot and dry. And then in the winter, it rains all the time, and so soils are really wet and saturated a lot of the time. So one of the concerns when we first started talking about um, this disease here and that the fact that it seemed to be becoming more and more of a problem was that more and more farmers are growing winter brassicas here. And so, and, and that our soil is really wet. And because club root is associated with really wet soils, it, we thought it was possible that because people were growing these brassicas in the winter, that we were getting a lot of infections in the winter. But that's not actually true. There's probably very little infection occurring in the winter, even though soils are very wet at that time. And that's because the minimum temperature for to create new infections of club root or Plasmodiophora is 55 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So here in Western Oregon, these are the average minimum soil temperatures at the four inch depth. 
throughout the year. So in January, the temperature is about 40 degrees, and then it slowly increases over time, and then becomes higher than this 55 Fahrenheit threshold in about May. It then rises up to about 70 degrees in July, and, and these higher soil temperatures actually make it so that it's even more likely that to, to get new infections than at 55. But then the temperatures decline and are below the threshold by October and then go down to about 40 again in December. So this period of May through September is when you're likely to get new infections. So overwintering brassica crops can, are planted here in late summer, and they do, can get infected then and develop clubs, and those then disintegrate as the plants move through the winter. But we have scouted fields in the winter, even when so, and, and even in these periods when soils are very moist in the winter, we don't see new infections in the winter. So that's good news. So now to move into management, we're going to talk about essentially how farmers can put together an integrated toolbox of club root management tools. And so there's six tools we're going to talk about today, and I'm going to talk about the first four, and then I'm going to pass this over to Aaron, and he's going to talk about the last two. So I'm going to talk about prevention and sanitation, scouting, soil moisture management and rotation, and then Aaron's going to talk about pH management through liming, and then also resistant varieties. So with any disease, the first thing that you want to do is prevent having it. That's the, your best management strategy. And so some farms don't have the pathogen. They don't actually have spores of the pathogen on their farms. Or they have spores of the pathogen in some of their fields, but not in others. And so in, that, in those cases, what you want to do is prevent movement of those resting spores into your fields or onto your farm. Canola is widely grown in Canada, and so there's a lot of good, and it's, and it's susceptible to club root and has become an increasing problem in Canada on canola. So there's a lot of good information on the internet about, canola, about club root management on canola, and so this is one of those websites. But basically, as we know from the disease cycle, the, the resting spores of the pathogen live in the soil. And so the way that those spores come onto your farm is with soil movement. And so anything that's going to bring soil on your, onto your farm or onto a clean field that's been in a location where there are spores in the soil are a source of the pathogen. And so tractor tires, vehicle tires or the back of pickup trucks, storage containers, tools, people and their clothing and boots, and even livestock. I actually know a farmer who, who feels like they got club root on their farm by bringing in livestock. Um, and so, and then as you consider these potential sources, you want to think of how you can clean them up if you do, in fact, need to bring them on their farm. So sanitation is a really uh, big um, initiative in canola production in Canada, and these pictures are, again, from the, a, a canola website from Canada. And basically, here, somebody's sampling soil from a tractor tire, presumably to figure out if they have club root in that soil. But also, you can use some kind of scraping mechanism to get soil off of tires, followed by pressure washing, and then followed by spraying a 1 to 2 percent bleach solution to try to get any spores that are it still adhered onto that equipment or storage containers or boots or whatever that you're trying to sanitize. So sanitation and prevention are really an important aspect of a, a club root management toolbox. So soil can also move with water, and I actually know of farms here in the valley that have moved um, club root spores from infested ground into clean ground because of flood water, and that's not something that you can control very well, but it is something to be aware of. So the next topic in management I'm going to talk about are scouting and record keeping. So here you see, again, this picture of a cauliflower field in which club root was detected and verified by digging up the roots to look for the clubs. And so it's really important to map where club root has occurred and then the crop and the year. 
And for example, here, if you have, if you scout the rest of this field and dig up roots and find that there was no club root over here, but it was really quite prevalent over here, you might want to take notes about that as well. And so why do you want to do that? Why is scouting and mapping helpful? So one of the most obvious reasons is because you want to manage your rotation. You don't want to forget where this infested cauliflower crop was and then plant a brassica right back on top of it next year because you're very likely to have a crop failure. You also want to minimize spread of infested soil to clean fields. And so you might want to think about if you, have, if, if you don't have much club run on your farm and you find it in one place, you might actually just plant a cover crop there for a few years and try to minimize the likelihood that soil is moving into your clean fields. Um, Aaron is going to talk about liming, which is a really effective management strategy. So if you know where club root is on your farm, you would identify those fields in particular to lime. You might also want to fine-tune ir your irrigation to avoid having wet spots, and we'll talk about that in a minute, if you know that you have club root spores in a particular field. And then over time, if you took these, kept these records for a long time, you might better understand the relative susceptibility of brassica crops that you grow to this disease. So uh, scouting and record keeping can be really helpful. Because, as we saw from the disease cycle, club root is related to high soil moisture or new infections occur because of high soil moisture or wetting events, typically you can scout wet areas of the field first because that's probably the most likely place that you're going to find clubs. However, this picture is an example of a situation on a farm that does ha did have club root in other areas of, of the farm, but this was actually a new field that they had brought on and that had never been planted to brassicas before. And as you can see, this, this cabbage field looks very healthy and very productive. Sort of serendipitously, we went in and sampled the roots of these cabbages and found pretty heavy level of clubbing on these cabbages. And, the, and so that was surprising because it didn't really look like there would be clubbing there. Or, and we also didn't think the pathogen was there. But this field had a very severe flooding event. And the most likely what happened is that the floodwaters moved the spores from some of their other fields where they had club root into this field. And so they would never have known, if we hadn't scouted it, that they actually already had club root in this field. So scout all fields, not just those with above ground symptoms, because you don't want to then plant back here a brassica fairly quickly and then have a, a, have a significant yield loss. The next thing I'm going to talk about is managing soil moisture. So I keep talking about this because it is pretty important. Because of these flagellated zoospores, which cause these new infections, soil, high soil moisture content is, is related to getting new infections due to club root. So a really important thing is to try to the best of your abilities to not create situations in which you have soil water logging like you see in this picture. So don't over irrigate. Your soil only has, has a certain capacity to hold water and move water through infiltration. And so you don't want to put on more water and more, more rapidly than your soil's ability to move that out of the root zone. One way to help your soil become better able to do this is by improving soil physical properties. And, and by doing that, in speeding up infiltration so excess water rapidly leaves the root zone and then you have much less time for the, the production of those zoospores. And to do that, and, and many organic farmers do this regularly, you add organic residues um, for compost manures and cover crops reduce tillage, and then avoid or alleviate compaction. And so improving your soil's ability to move excess water is a really good tool in this integrated toolbox. So the last tool I'm going to talk about is crop rotation. And I'm just going to start by talking about this great image, which is the cover of this book called Crop Rotation on Organic Farms by Chuck Muller and Sue Ellen Johnson at Cornell. And I love this image because it's a great image of a vegetable rotation where you have four 
vegetable families in a four-year vegetable rotation followed by two years essentially of soil building. And so overall, when you were thinking about a brassica or a cabbage family crop rotation, here you have a six-year crop rotation, one year in brassicas and five years out. And then you're also improving soil physical properties during this part of the rotation. And what I would say, for those of you who have the luxury to have such a rotation, that you're extremely unlikely to have economic losses due to club root with this rotation. This book has, uh, is, is both, has contributions by both scientists as well as some expert farmers in the Northeast. And they talk about all these different aspects of rotation planning. There are tables in the book that talk about the rotation requirements for specific soilborne diseases and in cl for club root they actually recommend a seven-year rotation. And so again, the, ro you know, the rotation length for club root is something that people um, continually discuss. I'm going to walk you through some of my thinking and, and, and talk about some of the experiences of farmers that we've been working with. Um, related to crop rotation for club root management. So here we do, we're coming back to this disease cycle and the, the critical piece here when we think about rotation is resting spores. And so when you think about d designing a crop rotation to manage a soil borne disease, what you're essentially trying to do is wait out the death of the pathogen. What you'd really want to do is never plant another susceptible host until almost all of these resting spores are dead. However, that's not very realistic when we think about um, club root because we know that it's, it's quite likely that at least some of them will still be alive at eight years. And unless you have an eight-year rotation, which isn't very likely, um, you're going to be in deep trouble. So you don't have to kill all of them. And so one of the questions is, is how many of them die, for example, at four years? So what you read in the literature is that the half-life of plasmodiophora spores, these resting spores, is four years. And so I, what I wanted to do is walk you through what that really means when we think about planning a rotation. So here we have a four-year rotation, which it seems like from that poll, some of you probably have a four-year rotation. And that seems like something that's achievable. So in a four-year rotation, you're growing cabbage family crops on about 25% of your acreage every year or one out of four years. So in the other three years, your plant or in the rest, the seven, other 75% of your crop land planting something else. So what, how does that work if the half-life of the resting spores is four years? So essentially, we'll just say there's some some resting spores on this farm. So when you plant the susceptible host or the brassica, you actually do get clubbing. And so essentially you're ex exponentially increasing the number of resting spores in that field. And at the end of the season, those spores are dispersed into the soil. Then you go through three years without brassica crops, and then you come back to that field. And if the half-life of the resting spores is four years, then at that point, half of them have died. But considering how many spores there are out in that field, because you grew so many up in the clubs four years earlier, that's still quite a lot of spores. And so if you do then plant a susceptible host again, you again exponentially increase that number, and then you have more than you started out with in the spring four years ago. So really what you would say that a four-year rotation is likely to increase your pathog pathogen populations or the number of those resting spores over time. And it wouldn't seem likely that that would control club root. This, of course, is all predicated on the fact that when you plant your brassica here, you're getting a, a significant wetting period. Because if you don't, then you're much less likely to get a, a new infection and potentially then you would escape that infection in that in that rotation cycle. So that's one thing to consider. So I'm going to talk about the experiences of two farmers that we worked with in this project. So here's the experience and this is described in the extension publication. So Aaron was working with this farmer and in 2013 this farmer had 
planted spring broccoli and had a complete crop failure. And so Aaron collected his rotation history and found, for the, for the previous nine years, and found that fi in five out of these ten years, including that spring broccoli crop, brassicas were planted. In some cases, those brassicas were part of a much broader mix of plants in a salad mix, but nonetheless, nonetheless that include, included leafy brassicas. And so, given this rotation history and what we know about the pathogen disease cycle, that's not entirely surprising that um, that broccoli crop had a crop failure. So, I've been working for a long time with a, an organic farm here in the valley that has a very prescribed four-year rotation, and they've been practicing that rotation for about for more than 20 years. And so this is a, a farm that's a really useful in terms of what happens if you have a four-year rotation for a very long time and you're growing 25% of your cropland in brassicas. So I've been uh, working with this farm for a while, and I was actually the person that first diagnosed clubroot on their farm on just a few in a few wet spots about eight years ago, and so since then they've been scouting their brassica crops, and I have been also to sort of get a handle on what's going on with clubroot on this farm. And so what both the farmers and I think is that while they occasionally have clubroot in wet areas in their brassica, brassica crops, they it's not increasing and also it, they do not consider it economically significant, which is a really, really interesting finding. And so one of the things that I've been sort of thinking about is what besides their four-year rotation might be at work here suppressing club root development. So one of the things about their four-year rotation that I think is really important is that they are really strict in, in lumping all of their host crops together in their the brassica part of their four-year rotation. So a lot of farmers will, will think only about their big acreage crops like broccoli, kale, cabbage, and cauliflower as being their brassica crops. And then they don't really think so much particularly about some of these salad grains because they grow them in such a different way. They're direct seeded, they're very short season, and they're salad greens, and so they plant them with their other salad greens. And they Bait, and because those are smaller acreage in any one planting, they sort of move them around in their rotation system without thinking too much about how they're contributing to soil-borne diseases club root. So this picture is actually of arugula plants, and every single one of those roots is clubbed. And so what I would say is that you really do need to consider both these leafy greens as well as these root crops as serious hosts of club root and make sure that you are not growing them in those three years when you're out of brassicas because they're all hosts. And if you look at these clubs here, that's really increasing your inoculum in the soil considerably. So in, on this particular farm, they don't do that. They don't plant those small acreage greens or, or root crops in these other years, they, they restrict them to that single year. The other thing that I think is also very, a very possibly a contributor to their suppression of club root on this farm is that they have excellent soil physical properties because they have a very long history of adding compost and manures, of cover cropping. They actually have the fourth year of their rotation in which they pasture poultry and they practice reduced tillage. And I have a lot of experience sample, soil sampling on this farm and I've actually gone out there right after a heavy rain thinking that I would not be able to sample soil to do a pot trial with and in fact found that it was actually quite, it was not wet, very wet at all. So this soil has a very, very high infiltration rate and so they, it moves excess water out of the root zone really fast, and so one of the things that I'm thinking is that they are very unlikely to see new infections even when they do have the club root propagules in the soil because of this water moving capacity that they have built up over time. In addition, since they know that they have club root, they also have been paying much closer attention to their irrigation. One thing I just want to point out is that they do maintain their pH at 6 and 6.5, so Aaron is going to talk about 
liming to over seven as a management strategy, which is a really strong management strategy, but this farm at this time is actually not doing that. So that pH is probably not contributing to a great degree to this successful suppression that they're experiencing. So in closing, for me, before I hand it off to Erin, I just want to say that I think that I would not, I would be hesitant to say that a four-year rotation manages club root because I think it's more likely that if you're relying heavily on rotation for management that you would need a five to seven year rotation. But it is possible, as we're seeing on that farm, um, that you could bring that rotation length down if you have an integrated package and, and, and also uh, if you are then actively liming as we're going to hear Aaron talk about next. So thank you very much and I'm going to pass this on to Aaron. All right, thank you, Alex. All right, um, like Alex said, I'm going to be talking about uh, liming and resistant cultivars for club root control. So just a little background. Um, you know, there's reports that liming has been used to control club root since 1750 in England. Um, liming doesn't kill the spores, doesn't kill the disease. It, it inhibits spore germination. And there's also some evidence that uh, if, the, if the roots are infected, it inhibits the uh, formation of secondary uh, uh, infection, which results in the actual creation of the, the clubs. Uh, literature usually says that a pH of uh, 6.8 is the minimum pH that you need to control the, the disease. And often, also in the literature, out of inconsistent control, which we also see with a lot of our own uh, growers. The goal with liming is to minimize the current in-season losses, but also to reduce future spore concentrations. So it's, it's you're looking at both short and long-term goals with liming. So liming has been very successful in uh, the Salinas Valley of California. Uh, Club root first showed up in this region, which is a huge producer of brassica crops in the late 70s, and there was concern that, that this disease was going to uh, devastate the industry. But through research, um, they started a, an aggressive liming program, and they still have it. But um, I was talking to the uh, plant pathologist in the region. He said, you know, it's basically a non-issue for him. Every now and then, a farmer will forget to lime, and it'll pop up again. But there in the Salinas Valley, they actually recommend a target pH of 7.5, which is, which is very high and actually di difficult to achieve in uh, other climates, especially in Oregon. But, they, but they are, they're in a climate where their soils are already naturally a little bit alkaline. Um, so we had sent out a survey in 2012 to Nebraska producers, and of the people that responded, 83% um, had used lime to help control club root. Um, and of those that have used lime, only 21% aimed for a, a pH that was actually high enough to even control the disease. 50% uh, never even uh, measured if they, their target pH was reached, and then only about a quarter said that it was actually helpful. So what we uh, came out of this with is that California has done it successfully. Why can't we do it successfully? And, and what we concluded was that there was a lack of information and research uh, uh, and resources on do so successfully. And that resulted in uh, basically four years of research, which culminated in this uh, extension publication, which you can get uh, on this site. And what is this publication is very unique. Um, this publication is 19 pages long, and half of the publication deals with just liming, how to do it correctly. Uh, if you look at most extension publications, they basically just say raise the pH, put lime on, but they don't actually tell you how to do it correctly. And so we created this seven-step plan. And like Alex said, um, everything that we're really talking about here uh, can be found in this publication in more detail. One thing to note is that liming for club root control is not equivalent to liming for crop production. And that's because if you don't reach the target pH in crop production, that's not an issue. Um, if you're shooting for pH 6.4 and you only get to 6.1, um, crops can tolerate a wide, wide range of soil pH, so that's not an issue. Uh, to attain a pH greater than 6.5, uh, most extension liming recommendations are not adequate, and I'll, I'll talk about that. 
And then also incomplete mixing is not as important in crop production. If you have zones of high and low pH, uh, the roots will actively grow into that zone of high pH. But for club root control, um, if you have zones of low pH, uh, you can get infection. So here's just a, a conceptual graph of pH in, in a soil that's well mixed and, uh, well, not mixed very well on the left and mixed well on the right. And if you were to come into both these soils and, and take a composite soil sample, each of those soils would have a pH of 7, but the soil on the left, um, you have zones of higher pH and lower pH. And what can happen with club root is that at those zones of lower pH, uh, you can get an infection even though the composite soil sample says, you know, you should, you should be controlling the disease. So the first step, obviously, you got to go out there there and, and know what you have. Um, so first step is to go out and soil sample to the depth of your tillage equipment, which is typically six to eight inches deep. Send that off to a commercial lab for pH and then uh, the, a pH buffer test. Um, in Western Oregon, we use the, the Shoemaker McLean Pratt uh, test, SMP, and that is equivalent to uh, the Sequora buffer test. Uh, some of you that are in other regions use different um, buffer tests and you'll have to adjust accordingly based on on your method but when you measure pH you're just measuring uh, hydrogen ions in the soil solution but most of the acidity is actually uh, in the soil we call that the reserve acidity and so that's what when we apply lime we're actually applying lime to neutralize that reserve acidity so that's and be buffer test for solution pH 7.5 knocks that, the hydrogen ions off the soil into solution, and then that change in pH tells you uh, how much lime you need to add to neutralize that acidity in the soil and get to your target pH. So step two, you want to choose a target pH. Um, so the literature indicates that usually a, a pH of 6.8 is adequate to con control club root, but we really never saw ad adequate club root control until we were uh, above a pH 7, and sometimes, you know, we're looking at 7.1 to 7.3, 7.4. So we recommend going for a higher pH if you can. Step three, you have to choose your liming material. So basically, the way lime, lime for, especially for organic, you're, you're just going to be magnesium and calcium carbonate, and that magnesium and calcium carbonate reacts with soil acidity to neutralize um, neutralize that acidity and, and raise the pH. And when you're choosing a lime material, you got to think about the cost, the speed of reaction, which will depend on um, your, your timing of application, uh, availability, what you have in your region, and equipment to apply. So this, this uh, table shows um, some different materials. You've got your calcitic limestone, kind of standard, super fine, which is a very fine material, reacts quicker, uh, dolomitic limestone and prilled lime. Um, the ECCE is an effective calcium carbonate equivalent, and that takes into consideration uh, how much pure calcium carbonate or magnesium carbonate you have and the, how finely that lime is ground and relative short-term uh, short rea uh, reactivity. Over the long term, most of these products will um, react, have the same performance, but over the short term, they react different, and then the relative costs. So you got to think about that when you're, you're choosing your material. So equipment to spread. If you're a larger grower, you'll probably hire a commercial applicator, and they'll come out, and they're very efficient and fast and have big machinery. But if you're a smaller producer, you're probably looking at using something like a drop spreader. Uh, most small organic farms have equipment like this. Um, or you might even use a spin spreader but the disadvantage of a spin spreader is you can see the, the dust that's created by the application. So an alternative to using the flower limes is to use pelleted lime. And the advantage to that is that there's less dust and it's easier to handle. So this is a picture of a farmer who was uh, trying to use a, a one-ton tote of flower lime. And um, his spreader only had a capacity of 500 pounds, so he was having to try to meter it out and then kind of got away from him. And, so it was a little bit more difficult to handle than, than the pelleted lime. Disadvantages to the pelleted lime is that it's more expensive, it's less reactive, so you need to put more on, and it requires some additional steps to, 
to be effective. So the pelleted lime has a, a binder that holds the lime together. And once it gets wet, it, it rapidly breaks apart. We call it slaking. And so this picture shows lime one minute after water has been added. So very quickly, it just, just breaks apart. But if you incorporate that, that pellet before it's had time to break apart, it's not going to disperse into the soil. So here's an example of lime that was uh, banded. And so even though there's no um, binding agent left, the soil is supporting it. And, it. and so in this case, you're just barely liming right around that prill, and the rest of the soil uh, remains at the same pH that you started with. So if you are going to use prilled lime, um, there's two different methods. One, you can surface apply it, either wet it up with irrigation or wait for a rain, and that'll cause it to break apart, and then, in, then you incorporate it. The second would be to surface apply, incorporate, and then if the soil is moist, and, uh, moist enough to break apart that binder, then you could do a, sef a, a second tillage. Or if the soil is dry, you want to, again, wet up the soil and do a second tillage to um, spread it out, disperse it in the soil. So one of the difficulties of liming above a pH of, of about 6.4 to 6.5 is that the soil pH lime response becomes nonlinear. So what that means is that you have to apply more and more lime to get the same pH change that you would have gotten below 6.5. Um, most liming publications that provide guidance rarely go above about 6.4, 6.5 um, because there's not usually an economic reason for most crops to go higher than that. Um, research in Western Oregon, we found that above about 6.4, you need about 1.4 times more lime to get the same response. So for example, if you were going from, um, took, it took one ton of lime to go from 6 to 6.5, it would take 1.4 tons of lime to go from 6.5 to pH 7. So that's maybe one of the reasons why our farmers weren't getting good control is that they were relying upon um, liming for crop production, the rates needed for that, to lime to a higher pH. So to calculate the lime application rate, um, there's like several different methods you can use. We're just showing you one method. The other method in, in our extension publication is, is geared only towards Oregon soils. But this is a more generic um, way to your application rate. So from step one, we, we, had, we got our buffer test value. In this case, it's pH 6.2. You'd come down to, to this table here, and a buffer test value of 6.2, you would need 5.4 tons of lime to raise your soil pH to 7. And this is for a 6-inch incorporation depth, and it's what we call a 100-score lime. This is lime that we consider is 100% reactive. Um, but most lime is not um, equivalent to that. So we, we put our value here of 5.4 tons. We put our, our product lime score, or if you're in a state that uses the um, uh, calcium carbonate equivalents, um, effective calcium carbonate equivalents, you would put that here. You put your depth of incorporation, because again, this table is for six inch incorporation depth, and you might be incorporating to eight inches. And so this would calculate your final, final rate, which would be almost eight tons of lime per acre. Um, for those of you that are, are familiar with liming, that is a lot of lime. Um, you know, typically in uh, liming for agricultural production, you're looking at one to three tons per acre usually. So it's one thing to consider is that uh, to raise your pH up to seven, especially when you have acidic soils, it's going it's to require a lot of lime, and it's going to be expensive because this is equivalent to about $500 per acre uh, using kind of standard ag lime at least in Western Oregon. Application timing is very important. Um, if the pH is not 7 or greater at germination, then the lime is not going to be effective. You might put the lime on and plant, and then you, you soil sample a couple weeks later, and you're like, oh, look, we're at a pH 7. Well, when those initial roots were growing, it might not have been pH 7, so they might have got infected before all the lime had reacted to raise the soil pH. Um, you need moisture for lime to react. If you don't have moisture, the lime isn't going to react. So you can't put it to dry soil and incorporate it and expect your pH to be where you want it. 
And lime is not mobile. It needs direct soil contact uh, to react. And just an example of that, I put out some lime. It was incorporated to three inches. I had 9.5 inches of rain over three months. I came back three months later, and the lime had not moved at all. So again, it, lime only reacts with the soil in which it's uh, in direct contact with. So what are our recommendations? Well, we recommend that you apply lime at least a month before planting. Give it enough time to react. Um, and fall application of, of lime is effective. So we had a, one farmer who started an aggressive liming program on his farm. He applied lime uh, in late August, early September, and we monitored the pH over the season until the until planting. And so even seven to eight months later, when he was starting to plant this, his spring crops, the pH was high enough to control the disease. And so applying lime in the fall, the benefit is that if, if you soil sample in the spring and the pH isn't high enough, you can add a little more. Um, and sometimes in the spring, the soil's too wet to get in there to work. Um, yeah, so just fall, so fall applying is, is an effective strategy. Incorporation is probably one of the most important steps in this process because you want to limit, eliminate those low pH microsites where infection can, can occur. So we had a, a trial on a small diversified vegetable uh, farm uh, looking at the diff, uh, relationship between tillage and uh, disease incidence and severity. So we had several treatments. We had uh, no lime. We had a lime with a with one x tillage, so that would be just one, a single pass with a rotary hoe, and then we had lime that uh, that was tilled twice. So what single pass with a rotary hoe followed by a uh, uh, rototiller, and so you can see the difference in how well the lime was incorporated. You can still see a lot of, of lime on the surface and chunks of lime, whereas uh, on the right where it was rototilled, you have uh, you can't see much of the lime at all. So the pH two weeks later, uh, we had a pH of 6.8 in the in the control, 7.1 and 7.4 in the 2x tillage. So the lime uh, reacted uh, more. The lime reacted. The pH went higher. So what's what's interesting to note is that even though the pH was 6.8, which is the the lowest pH they say, or the minimum pH at which you should get control, you know we are still getting about 60% infection. Once we got to pH 7.1, the infection rate was reduced to about 35%. And then by thoroughly mixing that lime, eliminating those low pH microsites, we reduced the infection to only 8%. And so how do you how do you know that it wasn't the the higher pH not and and to attribute it to the higher pH not mixing? Well, we had other uh, trials in the same field previous years that had uh, pH about 7.3, and we weren't getting nearly the, the control that we, we had when we thoroughly uh, incorporated that lime, thoroughly mixed it. And then the last step, and this is really necessary, is you want to actually monitor how well you did. So you want to um, you know, measure your soil pH at pre on your either direct seeding or transplanting, and then you want to monitor the disease to the season to see how well your program worked. And so, you know, if you didn't reach your target pH um, and or you didn't get poor or you had poor control, you know, you could take action by applying more lime before planting. Uh, in future, increase liming rates for fields with similar soil types, more thorough incorporation. Um, if target pH is reached but poor control, it could be due to um, poor mixing. So you can either try to increase your lime rate and mix mix uh, more thoroughly. And then if you exceeded your your target pH and you had good control, you can save some money in the future by cutting back on lime rates because you know if you put on five tons per acre and your pH was 7.4 and you had great control, well, probably on similar soil types, you could probably cut back to, you know, four tons per acre, and so you can save a little bit of money, because it's, again, it's not, not cheap to do liming. So just some key concepts. Um, 
you're never going to get 100% control with liming, most likely. Uh, we, we did it in the greenhouse. We were able to do that. But in the thunder field conditions, that's just probably not going to happen. Um, unless you get a target pH of 7 at planting, you're going to have little or no effect. You know, lime, you have to put more lime on than, than for crop production. Uh, applying and incorporating lime at least one month prior to planting is ideal. Uh, longer, longer is better. And then thorough incorporation is critical for eliminating those low pH zones. So I'm going to shift gears and go, well, actually, so I actually ended up uh, infecting my own garden with club root. Uh, I was careful to not wear my work shoes into the garden, but I unfortunately grew some transplants on a wooden bench that uh, was infected with club root spores. So it's really important uh, with sanitation uh, to prevent its spread, and unfortunately it, it got into my garden, but uh, so I'm trying some lime to, to control it. All right, so switching gears to resistant cultivars. Um, so resistant cultivars are pr is probably one of the best strategies. It's the cheapest and easiest to do. Uh, requires little or no changes to your farming system. Gives you flexibility of when and where to plant. Um, you know, a lot of farmers we work with have rotation plans in place, but usually what happens is in the spring they get busy and they have some plants they need to plant out and they have to get them in the field. So they throw out their rotation plan and, and just uh, plant where they need to. Uh, it can also reduce future disease pressures. So those resistant plants can cause spore germination, um, but they don't create new spores uh, you know, to increase this, the spore in the future. But they do have limitations. Resistance may be pathotype specific. Um, there's few available options out there and not all crops are covered. And even if there are, are available um, cultivars, you know, they may not meet farmer consumer de demand. And then frequent, if you use them too frequently, you can select for a population that can overcome the genetic resistance. So it's one thing you don't want to rely on them too frequently. So I'm going to kind of skip this, go really quickly on this. Uh, Basically, in, in Western Oregon, we used uh, what's called a differential set. A differential set is just a series of host plants that have different resistance to different strains. And there's several different um, differential sets, the ECD, European club root differential, and the Williams differential. In Western Oregon, uh, the only pathotype that we found was 160230 using the ECD set, which is equivalent to pathotype 3 or 6 using the Williams differential. Um, the reason I put this up here is because, like I said, resistance is pathotype specific. So if I'm showing you results from our study, you know, it may not hold true in your region with your uh, specific pathotype. We did some field and greenhouse screening of, of as many commercially available cultivars from nine crops that we get our hands on. Um, and this is the list right here. You notice that the kale is not on this list. There's no uh, resistant kale from the Brassica oleraceae family, such as like lacinato, um, no arugula, no mustard greens. So this is what we were able to get our hands on. So you can find the results for this, uh, for the uh, variety trialing. Um, you can find them on the Department of Horticulture, OSU's Department of Horticulture website, uh, Vegetable Variety Selection Resources. And the URL is down here at the bottom. gives you access to the PDF. And this is a, a table that we created um, in that guide. It basically shows the crop, the source, the variety, and tells you the resistance, whether it's high, medium, low, or none. So you can look at that. Uh, again, these are resistance to our pathotypes, although a lot of these varieties have been screened for resistance in other parts of the country. So they, they've been tested elsewhere. Just overall, um, so we found some, there's some high resistance for, for cabbage, Napa cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, and broccoli. Although we were only able to get our hands on one Brussels sprout variety, one broccoli, two cauliflower, uh, four cabbage, and I think maybe six six Napa cabbage. Um, there was low to moderate resistance for kohlrabi and rube, no resistance for pak choy. But what's most important is that uh, whatever 
resistant variety that the farmer grows has to be, you know, has to meet the horticultural um, characteristics of the farmer that they want to grow and has to meet the market demand. So one of the challenges we ran into is that some of these varieties aren't suitable for certain uses. Uh, for example, uh, this is a, a cabbage uh, called a tequila or tequila. I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but it's one of the resistant varieties. And um, we had a grower that was growing cabbage for um, not sauerkraut, but um, uh, coleslaw. And for him, this cabbage had too big a core because he would get docked uh, for waste when they once they core it out, the processor would dock them for the amount of waste. So for him, this cabbage wasn't suitable for his his system. Um, sometimes the the larger growers they have very low profit margins, so the seed may be too expensive for them. Some issues with uniformity. Um, we had a the broccoli variety we tested uh, didn't mature all at once, so it could be good for a, a small small grower who wants to do multiple picks, but for a wholesaler, maybe they just want to come in twice and be done with the field. And then a big complaint we heard was that a lot of these varieties had their days to maturity were too long. Um, one farmer said, you know, I, I want a cabbage variety that I can get out of the field in 70 days. He doesn't want a variety that's 90 or 120 because then he has to continue to water it. He has to uh, manage pests, so he just wants to get it out of his field quickly. And then some of the varieties the farmers felt wouldn't meet consumer demand, um, just in the shape and size of, of some of the varieties. So there are some, even though this is probably one of the easiest uh, management strategies, you are limited by what is out in the market and whether it'll work for your system. So just to kind of recap, you know, the title of this presentation was Integrated Club Root Management Strategies, and the key is integrated. Um, no one strategy alone is going to be enough to manage the disease, and so it has to be, uh, have to take components of, of rotation and liming, resistant cultivars, uh, irrigation management. Uh, we didn't talk about managing uh, weeds and, and non-crop hosts. You know, there's that the whole gamut of, of stuff that you need to, to manage um, to have a successful program. And that is the end of the presentation, and I believe Alice will be taking some questions. Yeah, um, we'll be taking questions. Um, we had a request to move backward to um, the variety trial slide, so I'm just going to do that for the benefit of those who are interested in finding out more about that. Um, moving on to the questions, um, what about self-seeding kale beds that produce year after year? And I guess it's a two-part question here. And when rotating brassicas, what is the minimum distance that must be kept between last year's rows and this year's rows? Um, so the first question was self-seeding, which means yeah, that essentially you have, you're constantly growing new, new crops right on top of old crops. I guess that would probably build up the pathogen over time. And so if you have the pathogen in that soil, it probably would not be successful in the long term. Um, this would be my answer to the first part of that question. And the second part was, oh, how far away? So it's all yeah. about movement of the spores. So if you don't have soil movement, you you won't, you know, it, for, so if your soil moves, whether it's in the winter with um, with water movement or and with tractors or people, then you will want to have more of a distance between fields. If, but if, if your soil doesn't move, then you don't need to be very far away, if that makes sense. Yeah. OK, um, next question. If, is there any improvement in reducing infection if the field is limed to 7.4 and not planted with brassicas for a season or more? Or does liming only have an effect for the year in which one is growing a brassica crop? OK, I think the benefit of liming really is the year 
in which you're you're growing the crop, um, because like I said, it, it doesn't it doesn't uh, decrease doesn't kill the spores. It just inhibits their germination, and those spores won't germinate until you have the uh, um, so so kind of they 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 think that the mechanism um, is that the the brassica plants exude um, root exudates, that then cause the spores to germinate. So really, there there's no benefit to applying lime and not growing. Uh, the brassicas in that year because over time your pH is going to start to decrease so you might as well apply the lime, grow the crop and um, and get the benefit in that year. Okay, um, has do you know if club root has shown up in the Hawaiian Islands? I do not. I, I don't know that, no. Okay. Um, if planting resistant cultivars, would it still be a host for club roots and increase the fungal population in the soil? Okay. So, um, one thing I guess I should have mentioned is that when you plant a resistant cultivar in the field, you're going to have some, you're probably going to have some low level of infection. Um, so, if you look at the the extension publication or that uh, handout, you know, I think um, I said it was highly resistant if there was, I think, under, I think, I forget what, what the threshold was, like 8% infection. So that just means that, um, you know, there is going to be a certain number of plants that do get infected and do, are going to release spores, but some, but it does tend to decrease the disease severity, so you are producing less spores. And then um, they they do cause the spores to germinate, but if you know most of the spores don't actually lead to creation of the the galls, then the overall spore, soil spore concentration is going to be going down over time. Does that answer the question? <coughs> Hope so. <laughs> you can tell us if it doesn't. Um, let's see. Um, when pH was increased to seven point four, how is the rotation affected? So is, I, I guess maybe I'm saying I'm thinking that they're thinking that uh, are there some crops that 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 high pH might be detrimental? Um, yeah, that's probably what they're asking. Yeah, so that that's a good question. Um, so a lot of vegetable crops can growing at a higher pH is not an issue. When I was in California, uh, you know, vegetable growers were growing crops on pH uh, soil pH of eight point zero. So not that detrimental to most crops, but I know um, you could get some issues with potatoes. Uh, I forget the disease. Um, there is like a potato scab maybe that might be influenced by pH. Um, if you're growing a grain crop like wheat, uh, at least in Oregon, higher pH can result in uh, what we call uh, take-all. So yeah, that is a consideration, but I think from if you're just growing vegetables, I think you're uh, you're not too concerned about the pH. Um, Alex, can you chime in about about this at all, or no? I don't know more than that. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, are there any known biocontrols such as beneficial nematodes or inoculants? I am not aware of any biocontrols for Plasmodiophora. So we, we tried um, we tried Serenade, and um, it didn't seem to help at all. That was we did it as a soil drench, and I think that's a, is that a bacteria? Oh, yeah. Been a while, and that didn't seem because to help. Okay. There had been some reports from greenhouse studies in Canada that that was effective, but we saw no response to that. And it's very expensive. <laughs> also, yeah. I mean, in that kind of a drench situation. So we did try boron. So boron has also been shown to, to help with infection. And, well, we tried it in the greenhouse. It didn't um, reduce infection rate, but it did reduce disease severity a little bit. But then we tried to do boron in the field, and we never really saw any benefit from boron. So we just didn't even include that in this, this talk. Okay. Um, so pH of 6.5 is definitely not high enough to help in club root prevention? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, it, it was kind of amazing. I mean, we, we were kind of thinking that the, 
Lyme response would be kind of linear. So, you know, you increase the pH, you get a little bit decrease in disease severity and infection. But it seems like it's more like a threshold um, response where really until you get to that high pH, you have little or no control. And then once you get to that high pH, then you start to get the, the control. And, and it's not just pH, it's a combination of, of pH and the calcium that's provided by the lime. So if you just raise the pH with, uh, say like, this is not organic, but like sodium hydroxide, you're, you're not gonna get the same control as if you raise the pH and also have calcium um, with it. So it's like a synergistic relationship. Okay. Um, let's see, is solarization effective to reduce infestation? That's a very good question, and I don't know the answer to it, quite honestly. I mean, I'm not sure. I guess the key point would be how much temperature would be required to kill the resting spores, and how high can you raise soil temperature, and how deep in the soil profile can you raise the temperature to that? To that temperature, and I don't, and I don't know the answer to that question. I've never, yeah. So I don't, I don't know the answer. So, so I think one, one of the challenges with the solarization is, you know, is like how deep can you, can you heat up the soil? Because mm -hmm. the infection tends to be most severe on uh, newly transplanted crops and direct seeded crops when the plant's small. And if you think about you know, transplanting, you have to make sure that that whole zone that you're transplanting into is disease free. So yeah, it would depend on, if it does work, it would depend on being able to, to increase the soil temperature deep enough um, to inhibit that um, infection. Okay, well I know before the webinar we were talking a little bit about weeds and um, so um, we have a couple questions here. Um, one of them is whether shepherd's purse is a host for a club root. And then another person mentions that they have less than perfect control of brassica weeds. And will that keep the pathogen too abundant? <laughs> Good question. Um, so I'm not sure about shepherd's purse. I mean, it is in the brassicaceae family, but um, you know, we have a lot of um, bitter cress, and I was able to um, cause clubbing on the bitter cress. And so, yeah, weed management of, of those brassica weeds is an issue, um, but not all of them, even though they're in the brassicaceae family, will club. And I don't have a good answer for which ones will and which ones won't. Um, so one strategy would be to scout your weeds and see if they're clubbing. Definitely. Yeah. Okay, um, let's see. Um, at what point in the life cycle or what triggers the galls to release the spores? Is it possible to grow a trap crop of brassicas and then pull plants and then burn them before the spores are released as a means to reduce the population? Well, the, so it would, when you grow brassicas, you're not, it really wouldn't work very well as a trap crop because the crop is only going to increase the number of spores. It's not going to, it doesn't have the potential to really reduce them, I suppose you could say, if they germinated. But yeah. So at any rate, the, the, the clubs disintegrate pretty rapidly and actually sometimes before you even harvest the crop. So I wouldn't recommend that as a strategy. Um, so, so there is some, there was some work done in Japan actually where they, um, they planted, I think it was like daikon radish. And so the daikon radish would get infected, but it w wouldn't form the actual galls. So it didn't actually increase the spore concentration in the soil. So that was a strategy where they, so it caused the, the roots caused the spores to germinate. They did primary infection into the, into the, um, the daikon, but then no new spores were produced. Oh, that's interesting. So, but it, again, it's one of those things where, yeah, they, they could see that the spore load was reduced, but it didn't necessarily always translate into decreased infection in the future. So it, 
you know, that will reduce some Spur Wars, but it's not guaranteed that it's going to be enough to um, get a great benefit in the short term. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, um, this person says he's been manually removing brassica roots to reduce spore <laughs> populations. Is this worth doing? I've actually talked to other plant pathologists about that, and um, I would say that if you like if you if you don't have very much club root on your farm and you first see it and you you scout that crop and you see it when the clubs are still young so very early before they start disintegrating that yes you could haul carefully get as ma as many of those clubs out of, out of your field and get them off your farm but once you have club root all over your farm it does not seem to me and I've talk to other people about this that that would really have much of a significant impact on the overall problem that you have. But if so from, from an anecdotal standpoint, you know, it seems like some fields you'll go into and you'll just see like a little, you know, like a little small patch of club root. And if that club root is not dispersed throughout the field, that could be an effective strategy because I think what we see is that, you know, a few plants get infected. Um, and then you come and you till the soil and then you kind of spread it out a little bit more and the next time you have a bigger patch that's infected and then you till again and spread it out more and then pretty soon you know you're you're infecting you know your whole field so I'm not sh you know I don't know personally whether how effective that would be but it seems like it better than doing nothing <laughs> okay um, let's see here's a question about pH um, isn't the pH of your soil determined by the bacterial fungal ratio of your soil, which you can manage by the type of vegetable matter that you add? So if your soil needs to be a higher pH to control club root, it seems that you would have to add more vegetable matter. Does that... Okay. So, um, okay, anytime, anytime you're growing crops that you're in the field, you are removing cations. So over time, just by growing crops and removing vegetative matter, you know, in your sand, you are some broccoli head, you are um, removing those cations and the soil pH is going to be lower. If you're adding compost, so compost tends to be high pH. Compost tends to have a lot of cations. So farmers that use a lot of compost, um, you'll they tend to have soils that have higher pH and that are more buffered against acidification. But in terms of like growing a plant to increase the soil pH, um, yeah, you're not going to get that unless you're bringing in compost or lime to to get the pH up. Okay, are tilled fields more susceptible to club root than fields that are never tilled? Um, I wouldn't. I don't know that tillage is, I can't see a reason why tillage would be related to club root. I mean, till, tillage may help spread it out more if you had isolated patches, but um, you know, you still got to get your plants into the field somehow, so even if you're direct seeding, you might be picking up contaminated soil that then spreads it around. That's the only thing I can think of in terms of control. Also, if you're not tilling and you have less, well, if you have less runoff and <laughs> movement in water, that right. could help prevent it from uh, spreading. Right. Your tillage would spread the spores around for sure. Okay. Um, let's see. Last question. Um, have there been any work drenching a field in a solution of brassica roots in order to encourage spores to generate? That sounds like the daikon experiment, <laughs> essentially. Yeah, that's interesting. I had never heard of that paper, yeah, but I mean, I don't know of of that particular, of you know. It seems like an interesting idea if you could identify the the chemical component of the root exudates. If you could somehow, if you could do it cheap enough and get it into the soil, I mean, it could potentially you know, work, but um, sounds like that's a, a research question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. 
All right, well, thanks everyone. Um, I think we're out of time here, but I'd like to thank everyone for all your questions. And um, thank you so much, Aaron and Alex, for sharing this research with us. And thanks to everyone for joining us.